in uh, from 1979 to 1983 4 I have been involved in being a leader of women for peace in Germany and uh, representing them in the national coordination of the peace movement working against nuclear weapons that was a very important coordination and by that I learned more to go on national level organizing on national level with social democrats uh, Christian democrats trade unions and all the different peace groups and I had to learn with others to keep them together you see it's a big plurality and partly they do not all like one another some are radical and so so I think that was a big learning process for me to uh, be a speaker of women for peace in the national coordination and I be became elected I got elected then too into the European coordination so in a way I think see it now from now uh, uh, it was uh, the biggest peace movement Germany ever had we coordinated the rallies in Rome London, Athens, Paris, um, Berlin and Bonn and Stuttgart and together with New York. I have been speaking in the uh, um, Peace Rally in New York on the 12th of June between Pete Seeger and uh, uh, a friend from the South Pacific. So I learned a lot about Europe then, that I have to organize Europe so that we are not forgotten like a little island and they are not doing their nuclear testing on us now. So I think that was a huge learning process to become uh, speaker and responsible uh, public person on national and European level and to learn to integrate different groups. It was very hard, it was not easy, I must say, I will not tell all the conflicts. But then when the, uh, when the nuclear missiles and the Pershing II were deployed at the, in winter 83, that was something like a decline of the peace movement then and a sort of depression and disappointment and then so the, the movements have their time too to grow, to have their high points and then to go down by different reasons. I had that feeling that a lot of people could not keep the same energy and time and capacity like many Germans did with a huge peace rallies. So one of my feelings was then uh, if I go back into uh, my profession either as a teacher or as a to university and uh, try to overcome like many others had that problem the joys but the disappointment and the defeat it was in a way a defeat of the peace movement we thought uh, that the nuclear missiles were deployed in Germany Italy and uh, England Netherlands and then there were the struggles of the Solidarność and Charter 77 and people environmentalists and independent peace and women groups in East Europe at the same time and Peter Kelly and I, we tried to combine it and the European Nuclear Disarmament Group I was in together with Edward Thompson and Rudolf Barrow. So it was a difficult decision. Do I go back into my profession? Do I have to earn money now to do my living? Am I able to get children or do I have to give all my time and energy for keeping maybe the movement together so it's not fully falling down? So then, my, uh, then it came out that I gave part of my energy then to the process of organizing globally that w and then I did it with the structures like many others in the world with the structures of the UN conferences. So I had been at the first Women's World Conference in Copenhagen 1980 and I had got a sort of sense, ah, maybe the UN is too bureaucratic and some corrupt people there and it's too much talk and not quick enough action but around the United States started something like the seeds of a global civil society and of a global women's civil society with the women's world conferences so I had got a little taste of that and I did not forget it so I followed since 1980 I followed the UN world conferences with women then the Rio conference came in the human rights conference uh, uh, habitat and so on that was where I tried to follow um, how can we build a global civil society and the structures of the UN were there and meeting around gave us an opportunity because I didn't have the money like many others to build our own structures for what you need money and leafleting and some jobs and so on so in a way I, I and others we try to use existing structures and use them for meeting and global democratic exchange and the other thing then I got the opportunity and that I thought, why should I not use the structures of the Greens, which I had helped to build up, maybe for the women's peace movement, which is where 
had no uh, no money, uh, no good infrastructure. So I decided by this background to run for the office of the Greens. Normally, I must say I prefer other jobs and activities and um, I know it's not a funny life to be in the presidency of a party if you take your job serious. There will come conflicts, they will be may vote you down and there will be tensions and you would prefer to have a child or to play music or to be in an ecological group where you can meet your friends each evening. So it was a little bit a sacrifice question too and not a... But it happened like it, it was in that sense, it was good that I really could be involved in national press conferences then. I really was involved then to decide where the budget of the Green Party is going. So I could look that some part of the Green budget is going into supporting women peace groups in Germany and worldwide. And we supported by the budget of the Green pr Presidency an anti uh, lower radiation uh, um, conference in New York. And then we supported um, uh, the first national uh, meeting of Brazilian ecologists in 86 even. And you see then the leaders of the Greens, which I then was elected for between 86 and 88. We got invited, I got papers, mountains like this, only by invitations. Because it seemed that environmental groups, but uh, peace activists too around the world, some of them had got the message there are some environmentalists and Greens voted into the national office and it's in Germany and they had the good idea, oh, they should come, they should help us to grow ourselves. So I like to do that a lot and so one of my decisions was to travel to Brazil because I had been in Latin America after my studies and had visited and I met Allende and had met Mapuche people in the countryside, I have been to the slums, I have been to workers, priests and to mother centers in Latin America and I have been to banana plantations where the workers are shot when they start uh, to organize a strike. So Latin America in a way was, had become part of me. So being in the presidency of the Greens, I had the chance to say, oh yes, that invitation from Brazil to the first national meeting of ecologists and it was at the end of the military regime in Brazil when they started to write their democratic constitution. I have been shooting that. The other leaders of the Greens all wanted to go to Moscow. They found, oh, that's maybe they had this still that left thinking, that's the center of the world. We have to go there to the meeting of the communist parties. No, I prefer to go to Latin America and to to be to put the ecology and the anti-nuke issue from the beginning into the debate about the new democratic constitution of Brazil. But what then happened was that Chernobyl happened before. So I was in the presidency of the Greens when uh, the nuclear uh, GAO uh, happened and started in Chernobyl. And I, when I saw the picture in television and I had had an experience the two nights before when the accident happened, I started to cry and I could not explain to me. So maybe in a way I was prepared and immediately I knew what responsibility that means. That I was in the presidency of the Greens and now an accident we have always been warning it could happen was now happening. And that needs other capacities, that needs another political language and another organizing if the accident really happens. You cannot just say, oh, they are dangerous and I have all these arguments. Or just say, oh, now you see we have been right with our warnings and have all these arguments. Now, I felt then responsible for those who are the first victims of the nuclear accident and for those who suffer it and cannot speak out in Russia and the Soviet Union and could not speak out what is nowadays Ukraine and Belarus. And I thought at the mothers of the children then maybe drinking the milk, drinking the water, not knowing what they are doing. And so I um, then issued uh, one of the first press declarations which was running on then worldwide saying this so-called accident, which is not just an accident, it's a starting catastrophe, it's a starting radiation catastrophe which will not end soon. It is a sort of ongoing catastrophe each uh, nuclear uh, and big contamination accident. I said probably there will be so many dead and ill like with the bomb of Hiroshima. And I said it by my background knowledge and combined with a sort of in intuition and feeling. 
and that message went around the world and then the Greens were demanding immediate closure of all nuclear power plants starting in Germany and we were starting, we were proposing uh, the necessity of free access to information. And I was calling the Swedish embassy and I went to the uh, Soviet Union ambassador at that time. And uh, the Swedish embassy at least gave me some information, but the Soviet Union ambassador was fully closed with any information. So I knew as much as we have to struggle for free information about what's happening and who are the victims and how can we help them and how can we prevent others uh, to suffer the radiation cloud coming now to Germany, then to the United States, to Brazil and so on, is that we have to struggle for free information within the Soviet Union too about, uh, about uh, uh, the nuclear industry and about uh, that catastrophe. So I did what I could together with friends and with uh, uh, the group of the Greens in the parliament and I was phoning my some friends of the anti-nuclear movement were phoning me immediately in the office and um, I think what we could do really, the role the Greens and I could have at that time in the presidency of the Greens, that I probably be helped that not too much wrong information and too much, what is it? Um, Yes, uh, uh, we are going into the world and in Europe. In that sense, you see, because journalists from other countries came too and they knew the Greens have different information than those other political parties. So uh, journalists from different countries were coming and calling uh, me. So it gave me a chance, though it was a very heavy burden and it was a shock for me, that uh, catastrophe of Chernobyl, but it gave me the chance to use that position to, to give free and independent and correct information to different journalists and, uh, and to the public. And then I could even use my phone and I didn't have to pay the phone bill because I was a member of the presidency. So I called friends in Brazil, I've called friends in Italy and warned them the nuclear cloud uh, uh, will come. The next thing I did, and it was a little bit risky, was as a member of the presidency I said, we should not have first May rallies under free sky, though it was wonderful weather. It was blossoming and it was blossoming spring. And, th and then I said, it's so sad, you can't see radiation. You see now blue sky and blossoming spring, but people have to learn that radiation cannot be seen and there are unseeable dangers now with the new technologies like with nanotechnology and electromagnetic fields too, you cannot see the danger. So I said, trade unions should not call for rallies in the streets now. And I was asked, uh, making a declaration, parents should keep their children at home, that's on, not send them to school, and to look what type of food they are giving them. That it's a pity and it's sad, but don't give them fresh salad. Go, di go Don't give them fresh milk and mushrooms. And uh, so I think, in a way that I could had a role to look for public information and for public health at uh, that moment. And I think if people use uh, positions, they are elected in, in that way, party positions or university positions, uh, it shows you can use that situation for social responsibility and to prepare yourself to be useful, especially in a certain historic moment. And the, uh, the other thing was, what is a rather current problem now too, that it was a, the year of the first intifada in Israel. So I had then to learn how I deal with that conflict and I'm very much for the existence of the state of Israel because I come from the, um, from the anti-Nazi uh, church tradition and from um, the 68 uh, reflection about the reasons and the anti-Holocaust uh, um, that we have an ongoing obligation with this, at, uh, at least even as younger generation, not in the sense of guilt, but as younger generations in the sense of responsibility. So I think Germany has a special responsibility for the existence, that there uh, can be an existence of the Israeli state, but at the same time we have to find a way how we can look into the human and social rights of the Palestinians, how we can support peace groups in Israel, how we can have a public space to bring uh, peace groups of Israel and Palestine, women from Jerusalem and Ramallah uh, together and uh, the Greens 
in a way since their beginning are working for a peace process in Israel and how they can help for civil conflict resolution and are campaigning now very sharp for for the ceasefire and humanitarian aid. And so I was in the presidency in the role to make a public statement to the Intifada. And so I, tr um, I traveled to Jerusalem the first time in my life and I tried to give a speech um, in that direction that the settlements have to be stopped, uh, but that we have to look to it, that the, the suffering of the European Jews should be understood by the Palestinians too. So that is a very important, and I think we need it in many areas in uh, the world now where the wars have been increased and violence against women and children has been increased in these wars, that we need capacities and budget and public talk which is helping the people in these struggles to not to demonize one another, not to fall into bad political leaders maybe of both sides who, who profit from the hate, who misuse the suffering of the people to build up political ideology out of it or their own either rebel or government power out of the sufferings of the people and play them against one another. So we need budgets, we need training and, and public political talk who is helping people in war-torn and conflict-torn areas um, to, to, to find a solution and to find, in spite of the wounds they gave to one another, to find a new level to build up a society together. So that was the role of the German Greens in that time too. How do we relate to the Middle East conflicts and wars and what is our non-violent answer to it? The Greens structured uh, beside their rules for party assemblies and election and speaking uh, rules and money uh, accountability rules. The presid presidency of the Greens itself has a structure that there is not one president but it's always, always shared, at least, between a woman and a man, so that never one man can be the president of the Greens. Now they have some problems with it, you see, and the media sometimes push you out. Oh, why do you have two speakers? Couldn't you only have one speaker, you see? And the, then some men suffer now that they think, oh, my career is not so good because we have to choose to the women. But we kept it and when there is uh, the attempt to change it, there the women's groups of the Greens, we have a special women group within the Greens, a women commission, they start their struggle again, why it is so important that we have a female male team in the head, the speak, and we do not even call them presidents, we call them speakers. That is important too, you see, because we want to, to go out of two harsh hierarchies and personal cult that there is, and, uh, but we wanted to be seen as a team and that within that team different groups are represented. So I was representing the women's peace and the peace uh, movement and the anti-nuke and women's movement within the others in the presidency maybe came more one more from the trade union, one more uh, from development politics so that we look that different fields are represented in it. And Normally, we should all be equal even. The rule is even officially we have two speakers, but speakers is another role. Then you say, oh, we have two presidents and the rest of the group is not so important. But then the question is always, how do the media deal with that? There is always a media pressure for more stars, for less team thinking, and the media always have an interest in dualistic conflicts. They do not like to report about cooperation or about good solutions. So in a way, it is not enough just to have another rule. Uh, in a way, it's like an ongoing reform. You have first to defend it in your own organizations, that it is not then at the end one president and the speakers suddenly are the presidents. But we have a presidents where the seven persons in it should be equal presidents and the speakers in that sense should only then speak for the whole. But it's easily changed by what you know, we are all human beings. Some things are more important and, uh, and uh, some are more pushy and all these very human things have been happening in the development of the Greens. And then I think the mass media and the global mass media nowadays for me are part of losing democracy and are part of increasing conflicts and wars. They are part of it because in their own structures to make profits and to be big global media, they 
all the time they want news, 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 all the time new things. But good democratic processes, good changes of lifestyle, building up a democratic team, you need time for it and you need processes for it. That means you need media who give people the thinking and the feeling again. We do not all the time to have action, 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 or to see a star. Uh, 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 that means you, we, uh, it's very important you can uh, the Greens partly, not fully, but they got some deformation in their development because when we got into government, uh, nobody was interested anymore into the presidency of the Greens. Nobody by the media, uh, big media, nobody of the big media was interested anymore what was going on in the party. The media only concentrated on the foreign minister, which was then a Green, uh, Joschka Fischer, as if he would be the party boss and the party itself then. So how you, it's, a, it's a lot of struggle then how you can balance it uh, from within and you can say that the Greens, the power center of the Greens was more shifting then from the presidency which is a team to the parliamentarian group and then shifting to the foreign ministry and the club of male friends more or less in a while. But when the Greens now after six years they are not re-elected again in, into government, I think it gave them the chance to rebalance now this type of power shift and to give a little bit of the power shift from the government stars back to the parliamentarian group which are 45 people who should be a good team too and should be seen as a team and not three stars only and then the others are only in the shadow and see the cooperation between the different working subjects they have to do and uh, the shift of power then again a little bit more back again to the party because a party in Germany and in Europe still is a democratic body. There is really something happening. It. It's not just there to lobby for election campaigns and donate. No, it is a democratic public in itself, the party assemblies in Germany. And uh, so I think we had a development where it was going a little bit more into mainstream forms of organization, professionalizing, some people got more money, some people got more media access, there is much more happening behind the doors and now the cell phones is an ongoing behind the door thing, you see. Uh, but at least we recovered uh, uh, from that, tot it's not a total shift, so we recovered a lot by being now out of government again but being in regional government. So I think the Greens now achieved something like that they learned a lot, they are not so radical anymore, they are more pragmatic, but at the same time they have still enough people on municipal, municipal level in government and enough working groups within the party who challenge their own pragmatism. You see, is it too much pragmatism now? Don't we have to have a more critical debate about Afghanistan? Don't we have to look that maybe in our own tax politics we gave too much tax cuts for the super rich and now we have to, to look that the social state in Europe and in Germany is by this type of globalization no eroding and then the uh, Reagan, Reagan economics and Bush economics uh, saying and IMF saying, oh, Germany is eurosclerotic, they all have this old-fashioned social state. So there is a lot of pressure coming from think tanks, from McKinsey, from IMF and, and, um, and in a way it comes from China and Russia too because uh, China and Russia do not really have a social state and are not real democracies neither. So I see it a little bit now that when this global uh, economy and global financial streams not at all democratically controlled, no international regulations till this moment of the crisis, that it is even a pressure at the same time from Anglo-American capitalism, Russia and China, which are all pressures are against the European social state and the union union's rights. So we have, I'm not saying that Europe is paradise, you see parts of the European elites are playing that game too, but there is related to all other countries in the world, I think, besides maybe Costa Rica, there is strong, there are strong democratic parties, strong uh, democratic unions and uh, public education, good media, public media 
and a, a, a social state with good public health for everybody, with good public education for everybody, migrants and all included. Even there is now medical care for illegal migrants. They are trying to organize and make it official. And this is endangered now and under pressure. One part of it is that the Eastern European states are coming in and they believe a lot believe a lot into the American model. They think, oh, look, we don't want to be in old-fashioned Europe um, and then with these socialist parties maybe and we don't w want to have the American shelter against the Russians because they were suffering uh, uh, the Russian pressure and the Russian imperialism, the Eastern European states. So it's very easy now, like Bush tried to do, to split Europe and say, oh, there is the old West Europe with Germany and France. They are still in this stupid old-fashioned so social state. And then there is a new Europe where they're going fully down with the taxes. In, in Slovakia they have zero taxes. Uh, and they play that against us, you see. They try to split us. Putin tries to split us too, you see. And then with labor going to China and outsourcing labor. So there are a lot of pressures of the social state. Now on the answer of the Greens was from the beginning, even 30 years ago, we have been previewing that with the new technologies, the communication technologies, will bring a lot of unemployment and jobless and a lot of international quick internationalization of global economy and that is going behind the national regulations so and, and the internet and the cell phones and um, are uh, in a way a tool for financial markets and all big business and big mafia loopholing and going behind the backs of all national regulations so our social state we have still is a national regulation. So we have to find now a way how we keep some national regulation, but at the same time we need international regulation of the financial streams and even we are calling therefore for international taxes like the Tobin tax and others or taxes on CO2 emissions like a global tax because we need, if we do not have international regulations on some levels and a good one, the social, the national regulations related to environment and social state can very quickly be eroded and torn, torn down. But we um, know that we cannot just keep the traditional social state we have. We have to look into some arguments to modernize it and maybe to... Uh, and that's, that is, for example, one proposal of the Greens and some others is now not to have any more the traditional unemployment money and social welfare care, but to give a minimum income to every person. That is now the rather cultural radical proposal and they are even doing internet vote on it now, um, um, the Greens. And we are. Uh, there is an international coalition with Brazilian scientists. They say each human being should have a sort of, there should be a sort of dignity lifeline for each human being in the world. That means, I personally think it's we cannot make just struggle for minimum wages in Germany. Um, uh, we have to struggle for vin minimum wages in China too, because how do you want to keep minimum wages in Germany on the level between 7 and 10 euro? If maybe in Romania it's only 2 euro and then in China it's only 0, 50 percent. So we have to have global democratic campaigns and the trade unions have to wake up um, uh, but the consumer organizations too and independent media and to support all those who are struggling in China to get better um, health care. Uh, th in, in, I saw it in Korea and it will be in China. Many people have accidents in China, they get their hand or their arm cut and there's no insurance for them afterwards. So I think it's no, uh, uh, we have to think in, in that democratic globalization in a way that we can keep and struggle only in the US and in Europe to keep or improve a social state when at the same time we are fighting for workers' rights and independent union and consumer union rights in Indonesia, in India and in China. And yes, and my, maybe I, I give you um, that message where I have been in a meeting with migrant workers in Korea, which is rather near here to California and, and Hawaii, nearer than to Germany, and there's a lot of Asian migrants coming in, and there are millions of migrant workers in 
China and we have the push now from migrants coming from Africa in Europe so it's a global migrant movement and so we have to look I think for something from minimum health care and minimum working uh, security uh, for the migrant workers including the migrant migrating women on the 18th of June 1989 which has is uh, the year when a normal uh, the date when normally uh, the division of Germany was remembered in a certain way and some weeks after the massacres of uh, on Tiananmen I was elected uh, to the European Parliament with other seven um, uh, Greens from Germany and it was a joy for me to fr meet friends from Italy and France and even one from Spain but it was a disaster that in England at that time 14% have been voting the Greens in 1989 too. That means even more than in Germany. And they had no possibility to come into the parliament. That was our first protest action because they have such an election system like here, the winner takes all. That is rather undemocratic because 5% groups, 7% groups, and then even 14% of the Green electoral vote in England was thrown away as if not existent. So it was good that from the beginning the, Europe, the Greens from different European countries are making, have now a party coalition of different European Green parties. We are different and the German Greens are the strongest because we have that special history and uh, special chances we are having but we try to help uh, the other Green parties to develop and to be have be a sort of political European voice relating to European and international issues. And then we have a European Green parliamentarian group that is made up by the German delegation where I was a member of, a French delegation normally. Then we had for a while an Italian and even a Finnish and a Swedish delegation, an Irish delegation. And now at least Carolyn Lucas and uh, uh, another lady is in from the British Greens. And uh, it was um, wonderful. Uh, I think it was my best, the best job I ever had. Not in the sense that I earned uh, money which I never will earn and have earned. No, it was in the sense that I finally could work in a European team. I like that a lot lot because each day I was remembered that we have different languages but each day it's not only different languages it's like here different cultures different political cultures so it was something like I was motivated and pushed to learn uh, each day and I think I was happy too because I could bring in the other Germany and I saw that even in Europe still they have to learn there is another Germany now and that is my message here now too. There is another Germany now after the war and it is here since 40 years. It's developing and it, ha it ha has learned from other countries. It tries to enrich itself by a more multicultural uh, society. And um, yes, and, I, and, I, and I, I think I can say that the Greens and the development of the Greens and being in the European Parliament has been part of changing uh, uh, Germany out of the war and fascism and Stalinism into a much more democratic society and, and I think I even this moment can say uh, that Germany is one of the most democratic um, and uh, countries in the world now. The government is lobbying now to s uh, go, uh, stop all nuclear weapons. The government is lobbying now to go out of nuclear energy. The government has at least a part of it, a part of it at least knows there is danger in biotechnology uh, and we have to look for to support local farmers in Africa and the government and even our uh, Chancellor Merkel who is not my political party but she has taken climate change serious uh, uh, the last uh, six years so uh, yes I hope uh, uh, that you see I uh, do not think uh, that may we can keep that democratic life in Germany if we are not doing cooperation now because there's a pressure from Berlusconi which is a very I think a very bad uh, government in Italy there is a pressure of Sarkozy to sell nuclear plants to Morocco and Egypt and maybe Syria that's crazy uh, there Putin is allowing to shoot human rights fighters in the street in Moscow there are environmentalists and 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 workers law workers rights lawyers in China who are put into prison then 
th that they should be put into a government. So there are a lot of pressures on on different democracies now. So saying that I'm proud that Germany is now such a very, rather green and democratic lively democracy means at the same time it will not be easy to keep it and we can only keep it as part of all those attempts to strengthen democracy and, and grassroots ecological and human rights movement around the world and I hope that California and Bolinas and many rural communities here uh, that we yes that we are sisters and brothers to saving and respecting our planet and our own dignity. Mm -hmm.